This is Megan's first trip to the snow. Dad took her up to Big Bear. Her childhood was, uh, was with me. Thank you for everything. Yes. Is it worth dumping me for the rest of my life? Is it worth getting rid of her father? So this past Sunday, our very own Australian Channel 7 debuted a Markle tell-all featuring Thomas Markle Sr., Thomas Markle Jr., and Samantha Markle. Now, this wasn't just the first time that Thomas Markle has appeared publicly since his stroke, but it's also the first time that we've seen and heard him speak. And I must say, he's made such amazing progress in, I think, less than a year at this point. For those of you who don't know, he actually lost the ability to speak. He had to relearn how to talk after suffering from a major stroke right before the Jubilee last year. And while he's doing a great job, of course, it was also still really heartbreaking to watch him and hear him speak because you can still see the remnants and the effects of the stroke. But he's such a lovely, brave man, and it was really nice to be able to hear from him again. And in case you're wondering, since we're on the topic of the stroke, did Megan ever reach out, even through a text message, to ask after her father and see if he's okay? Well, sadly, Tom confirms what we've all known instinctively for all this time. I'm taking it from that that she hasn't called you. No. No phone call? No. As for answering why she hasn't, well, I think by now we've all learned so much from Megan simply by observing her and her antics. I mean, she's already added a new attempt to overshadow the coronation by announcing she was signed by WME. So, you know, talk about predictable. But it's always insightful to hear from the people who loved her and still love her and knew her best. We interrupt this program to bring you a special report. Before we get any deeper into the video, let me just say that if you get a comment, a response to a comment from someone pretending to be me on YouTube or any other platform for that matter, asking you for money or giving you a WhatsApp number to communicate with me directly, that is not me. I've made a YouTube community post already to warn all of you, I would never presume to ask anyone for money. And you all know how private I am. I would never share a number and communicate with anyone through WhatsApp. Bots are abound, even for small channels like mine. It's crazy. So this interview was actually the first time that all three Markles were physically together in years. Thomas Jr. lives right down the road from his father in Mexico, but Samantha, who suffers from multiple sclerosis and is wheelchair bound, lives in Florida. So she couldn't even see her father in person as far as I'm aware after he suffered from his stroke, which made the reunion scene so much more emotional and special. Okay. Everything okay? Yeah. Okay. And I must say, Tom Sr. is looking quite strong. He's got a good pace. He's got a good steady walk, standing upright, even though he does have a cane to assist him. But of course, as I said, the stroke definitely had a severe impact on him, one which he spent all of this time, the better part of a year, recovering from. But I will say that when you listen to him talk, Megan's mistreatment of him has left a much deeper scar. He is an interesting one, Tom. From the beginning, ever since he surfaced you know, in the public, when the media essentially forced him to surface, his responses and his comments about his daughter and even her husband indicates that he is a very strong-willed man with a backbone to stand up for his family. A side of him I really enjoyed watching in this particular interview was his sense of humor. I never rejoiced a Hitler. And you've never been to the Arctic and frozen your Never, if they did, I certainly wouldn't tell anybody. Something his daughter clearly didn't inherit from him. But at the same time, 
he displays a lot of vulnerability and pain and unmistakable sadness. Megan, she loved me. I'm a hero. And suddenly I was thrown out. On a lighter note, seeing him with his two eldest children was really heartwarming because you can just tell how much they love and respect each other. Thomas Jr. is a comedian who lightens up the mood and doesn't seem to take himself or his sister, for that matter, Megan, too seriously, which is definitely something the family needs because it can seem all doom and gloom. When she told the world she was an only child, I mean, were you disappointed? No, I just made a little mark on my board and said, oh, there's another lie, click. Samantha is the strong-willed woman that she's always come across as, someone who has a no-nonsense approach and who isn't afraid to speak her mind and tell it as it is. In my opinion, she would still be a waitress if it wasn't for dad. Quite the opposite of her sister, who seems incapable of making direct statements and always relies on, you know, read between the lines. I'm never gonna give it to you straight. And you know, speaking of Samantha, I'm so glad that she in particular had the chance to do this, to do this tell-all and this interview and to give us her perspective. Because if her case, her defamation case against Megan gets dismissed again, permanently this time, she at least has this medium to combat her sister's lies and to put the truth out there. I called her my sister. My little sister, though, I said, if there was any descriptive qualifier. She was my little sis. Because at the end of the day, that's really what that defamation case is all about. Samantha isn't really asking for much. 75 grand is pennies to Megan. But as any person would want, she just wants to set the record straight. Speaking of the court case, there has been an update, so I am planning to make a video to update you all on the latest proceedings, so please stay tuned for that. Now, the interview as a whole, I'll be honest, I didn't necessarily learn anything new. There weren't any revelations per se, but that's probably because I'm someone who's been keeping up with the Markles. And at this point, there hasn't been anything new because, well, Megan just keeps repeating the same old spiel, you know, the same old story. But having said that, seeing them together, you know, put on this united front as a family, and hearing all of their accounts effortlessly align with one another, it really helped make them come across as this credible, cohesive, raw, and honestly still hurt and confused, particularly on the part of Megan's father. Even though it's been six years almost since Harry met Megan, and even though her attitude towards her family turned icy pretty much, you know, very soon after that, you can still tell that it was a real curveball that Megan threw at them because they just don't come across as people who ever saw this coming. You know, Samantha called Megan, I think it was right after the engagement announcement to congratulate her sister. And as soon as Megan knew who it was, this is back in 2017, I believe, she hung up on her and she never heard from her since. And what does that tell you? I mean, to me, just looking at all of the footage and you know the videos, the photos that the family shared from Megan's childhood, it serves to bolster their narrative, which is that Megan was very much a part of the family and that she was absolutely adored by her father, was spoiled rotten, and was taken care of, especially when she lived with her father for most of her schooling, when her mother, Doria, seemingly disappeared for the better part of a decade. What's really heartbreaking and disconcerting at the same time is how quickly and viciously she was able to turn against her father, despite all of the love and the tenderness that they both clearly shared in their past. I mean, it was almost palpable. Megan was well and truly a daddy's girl, and Tom relished that. Unfortunately, there is really no other way to put it. She threw him out. And it practically happened right before our eyes in public. I mean, if that's what she's capable of doing 
under the public's watchful eye, especially at that time in the lead up to her wedding, all eyes were on Meghan Markle. It really makes you wonder what that woman is capable of doing when no one is watching or when she thinks no one is watching. Because this is something that I say frequently when it comes to her treatment of Harry in public in front of the cameras as well. And to really put her coldness and her ruthlessness on display, Samantha poses a question. And then he's had a stroke. Like, how many close calls does it take for someone to care? I mean, that pretty much sums it up quite neatly, doesn't it? But, you know, when you really think about it, after everything we've watched play out over the years, it actually would have been a lot more surprising and out of character if Meghan had reached out to Thomas after he had his stroke. I certainly don't remember there being any shockwaves, you know, felt after it was pretty much confirmed that rather than go see her sick father who just suffered from a major stroke, she went over to Uvalde for her sickening photo op when the focus should have been solely on dead children. I mean, <laughs> when you consider the reason that she apparently stopped talking to her father at all was because he arranged a benign, you know, innocent photo op to improve his own image at the expense of no one else, that was bad enough to cut him out forever. But when she does it using dead children, it's all fine and dandy. You know, whatever Megan does, goes. But while there was outrage and disgust over, you know, her decision to go to Uvalde rather than see her father, it was entirely foreseeable and predictable, as pretty much most of Megan's actions are. Because, as I said in the last video, considering that past behavior is the best predictor of future behavior, why on earth would anyone expect her to suddenly grow a heart and go see her ailing father when she pretty much pretended he was already dead when he had the audacity to have a heart attack right before her wedding. I mean, that's pretty much what did it, right? She just cut him off and proceeded with the wedding, pretending that her father didn't just suffer from a heart attack and might be dying at a hospital. That was the last time he heard from her. I mean, she says it herself in her Netflix reality show. I've lost my dad in this. You know, it really makes me wonder around the wedding time when all of this transpired, what did the queen and Prince Philip and the rest of the royal family think when they saw this playing out right before their eyes? Did their hearts collectively sink, you know, signaling the dread that surely some of them at least must have felt at the prospect of welcoming this heartless creature into their own prestigious ranks? I mean, if she's willing to do this to her own father, what is she capable of doing to us? Well, they soon found out. I mean, she certainly didn't keep them waiting, did she? Meghan Markle moves fast. Whatever the case may be, it's clear that she was determined, you know, now that she was right at the end of the race, she's right there at the finish line, not to let anyone or anything get in between her and that altar, not even own father's possible demise. You know, when you come to think of it, that wedding, a joyous affair, which was meant to herald the start of a new life and the creation of a new family, also heralded the death of an existing family. And of course, I don't mean literally, but their family, the Markle family, as they knew it, died that day. The family that she came from, the people who shaped her, the people who supported her and made her the woman that Harry fell in love with and decided to marry. I mean, you think Harry would have fallen for her if his friend told her, oh, she's a waitress. <laughs> I mean, he says it himself in his book. He Googled her. He was starstruck by her glamour, this Hollywood starlet posing on red carpet after red carpet. That's what drew him in, like a little starstruck teenage boy. And as we saw at that wedding and heard, you know, from then on from various family members, Meghan Markle wasn't taking any prisoners. She iced everyone out ruthlessly. Everyone but her mother, of course. So let me get this straight. The woman who supposedly wasn't there made the cut, 
but the man who gave Megan the world didn't. Which begs the question, why? Why did Megan so ruthlessly cut out her own family when she met Prince Harry? I'll tell you why. What she told the royal family, what she told Harry, wouldn't have jived, wouldn't have been consistent with the truth. If anything untoward had happened to her at their hands in her younger years, wouldn't she have cut them out sooner? Wouldn't we have heard of it by now? Would she have made all those Instagram posts and TIG blog posts gushing about her father and the influence that he's had on her? I mean, I think she even mentioned him in her UN speech. I went home and I told my dad what had happened. And he encouraged me to write letters. So I did. Even when she enjoyed her success with Suits, even when she started becoming independent financially and, you know, jet-setting the world, she still didn't cut her family off. So using the process of elimination, the only answer, the only plausible answer that remains is Prince Harry, or rather the royal family in general. Because Meghan, as most of us already know by now, effectively rewrote her own history when she met Prince Harry. Heck, if you believe that she had her eye on him you know, for a long time before they met and planned their meeting meticulously, then you could argue that she started rewriting the narrative well before she met Harry. You know, what with arranging those trips to Africa and taking photos and posting them on her Instagram and basically prepping herself, recrafting her image to become a woman whom she thought correctly Harry would fall madly in love with. And it continued soon after she met him, when she had her Wikipedia page edited on the 9th of October 2016, a few weeks before the relationship went public, where she notoriously changed her descriptions from, what, actress and supermodel <laughs> to a uh, humanitarian and activist. Uh, Megan, I think you forgot to add the word cosplay before humanitarian and activist because that's essentially what you're doing. You're cosplaying to be these things, or even worse, you're cosplaying the man's own dead mother. But I digress. We know that Harry, in the lead up to the wedding, gave that notorious radio interview where he said, oh, Meghan's finally getting the family that she never had. And that certainly raised eyebrows in the Markle clan. We have the flat out lies that she told during her Australia tour where she gave this speech in Fiji while she was pregnant. It was through scholarships, financial aid programs, and work study, where my earnings from a job on campus went directly towards my tuition, that I was able to attend university. We have the letter to the government in 2021 when she brought up the Sizzler bar story, which again, turned out to be a lie. The broken down car, that was a lie. Everything was a lie, at least according to her family and, you know, those who knew her. Samantha knew about the car. Her father paid for her schooling and university. So for them to sit there and hear her stand there on a public stage and lie through her teeth so confidently, it must have been chilling. But as Samantha said, this was all in an effort to really push this rags to riches princess story that for some reason, Meghan thought would sound a lot better than the truth. And based on all the evidence that the Markle family has been able to produce that Meghan has not been able to refute to this day, I'm personally inclined to believe Samantha when she says that this is why Megan iced out not only her family, but pretty much most people who knew her since her childhood. Because she sold the royal family a lie, a fake imagined version of herself, and she didn't want her own family exposing the truth. As for Doria, based on her performance on the Netflix docuseries with her best impersonation of Amber Heard and fake tears, or I should say non-existent tears because I couldn't see any, I'd say that Unlike the other members of the family, she made it clear to her daughter that she was willing to play the game. And the more I learn about Megan, especially when I hear from her family, the more questions arise. Because any normal person would be proud of the background that Megan came from. 
as Samantha described it, it was basically an upper middle class privileged upbringing where she went to the best private schools, the best university, she had a good family who loved her, there was no controversy, there was nothing to be embarrassed of. So why did Megan feel the need to recraft and rewrite her entire life story? Well, right in line with her very apparent narcissistic tendencies, the answer once again points to Megan's ego. What she did was engage in self-glorification and leave everybody else out of the equation as if she existed in a vacuum. There you have it, self-glorification. And it really makes sense when you consider Megan's personality in general, or at least the personality traits that she has been obviously displaying to the world. This is someone who clearly suffers from delusions of grandeur and a severely overinflated ego. So much so that she didn't want to play second fiddle to the Queen of England from what we've been hearing. And for whatever reason, it looks like Meghan decided at some point that her true authentic self wasn't good enough for the royal family. It doesn't seem like she felt that she was good enough. She had to inflate who she was to garner false admiration and to be accepted by the royals. So that story, also known as the truth of her being a privileged girl from America, who had everything she ever wanted and had every door open to her and had every opportunity that a parent could hope to give their child, nah, that didn't sell well. She needed something that would cast her in the role of the struggling but brilliant protagonist who, against all odds, single-handedly pulled herself out of the poverty-stricken life that she led to then blossom and grow into this majestic, dazzling hero figure who is out to save the world with her wisdom and her compassion. It all makes sense. Now we know why she couldn't let her own family anywhere near the royal family. Now we know why she tried so hard to silence her family to the point of threatening her father to cut him off if he didn't cut off his own two kids, Thomas and Samantha. It's like Thomas Markle Jr. puts it. She just woke up one day in a new world and decided that she doesn't have any family. And you know he's right because it lines up perfectly with what Prince Harry said about Meghan finally getting the family she's never had. It lines up perfectly with her nonstop comments on the Oprah interview and the Netflix docuseries about how, oh, I've always wanted siblings. I've always wanted a big family. I was so happy to finally be a part of one. Why would I want to destroy that? Gee, I, I don't know, Megan. It's a question that we're all asking ourselves, really. You know, maybe you should get some help and <laughs> find out the answer because you've now not only destroyed your own family, but you've now destroyed the extended big family, the royal family, that you were apparently so overjoyed to finally become a part of. I mean, it's crazy that she doesn't see how transparent she is and how nothing adds up. A lot of us saw right through her facade, you know, during that engagement interview when she said, Was he nice? That's the phony. That's the version of Meghan that she portrayed herself to be, not only to Prince Harry and the royal family, but to us as the world at large. And uh, little did we know that that little disingenuous display was just the tip of the iceberg. At some point during the interview, a clip is played from Harry's audiobook in which he describes the unmistakable grief that Meghan felt as a result of mourning the loss of her father. Now, the interviewer at this point makes a brilliant observation. It sounds as though you did. Yeah, exactly. She killed me and then mourned me. That was a slam dunk if there ever was one. Now, this interviewer was asking a few tough questions, so, you know, perhaps Oprah Winfrey should uh, take some notes. Because he basically asks the Markles, all three of them, aren't you guys just as bad as Megan? Isn't she just a carbon copy of you in the sense that you're here you know, giving a tell-all interview without her consent, showing photos and videos of her childhood without her consent. 
just as she has done to not only you, but her in-laws. And he also challenges Thomas Markle about the leaking of the Dear Daddy letter that Megan sent him in August of 2018. And I'm glad that he asked these tough questions because it once again gave Tom a chance to give his version and to clear the record. Being that his hand was forced by his own daughter to not only leak parts of the letter, to clear his name and defend himself against all of the accusations that her five anonymous friends made in the People Magazine article, but also defending himself in general right now doing this tell-all against the false narrative, as they claim, that Megan is spewing and making millions out of. At their expense, of course. And I 100% believe Thomas Markle when he says that had her friends not made those allegations and referenced the contents of the letter in that People Magazine article, he would never have shared anything from it. And the reason I believe him is because number one, he sat on that letter, he had that letter with him for months, I believe from August 2018 to February of 2019, so six months until he leaked parts of it, the parts that didn't paint his own daughter out to be a horrific, cruel, mean, and ruthless person, because the rest of the letter, he says, was just that. It was mean, it was hurtful, and he said he would never share what she said to protect her because it was that bad. In fact, he also claims that he's been offered money, lots of money for this letter, and his response to that was, I, I'll burn it before I sell it. See, this is the crazy thing. Even when this interview was announced on social media, if you look at the comments, and this was on Twitter that I read this, a lot of people came out to defend Meghan Markle in full force, insulting Channel 7 and calling the Markles every name under the sun, every horrific name, because they dared sit down to tell their version of the story. I mean, it's all fine and dandy for Meghan Markle to do that over and over and over again, on a much bigger platform and with lies, or at least mistruths, as she likes to say. But when her family wants to come out and correct the record with evidence and with the truth, their horrific cash cows who are profiting out of their you know, own daughter and sister's name, are these people for real? Are their heads buried under the deepest, most toughest sands of the planet? Because how else would they even have the audacity to make these comments. And once again, Samantha says it best. When you look at, in my opinion, what she and Harry have done, who are the gold diggers? Who are the opportunists of family name and of family stories and of photographs? The double standard displayed by Meghan and Harry is one thing, but to see strangers enforcing that double standard, you know, for people, who couldn't care less if they live or died. You know, Meghan and Harry don't care about anyone other than themselves. It's mind boggling. It makes you question how on earth we can all belong to the same species. So different is our way of thinking. Thomas Markle seems to think that the key to reconciliation lies with Prince Harry. I know, I didn't see that one coming, honestly. Because on that point, I unfortunately have to disagree. Because Meghan has well and truly poisoned Harry's mind, not only against her own family, but against his own family. So what hope do we have there? How can we expect him to reconcile a broken family whom he's never met? So he doesn't know the Markles. All he knows is what Megan told him. When he isn't even capable of repairing the rift or even preventing the rift from happening with his own family, whom he grew up with and loved and knows better than anyone else on the planet. And this woman who comes along at some point in his life was able to convince him that his entire childhood was a lie. And aside from that, I think it's blatantly obvious that in that relationship, Meghan Markle calls the shots, not Prince Harry. As Harry said notoriously 
what Megan wants, Megan gets. Which I will say, he's denied ever saying that, but I'm sorry, Harry, your credibility is pretty shot. I mean, remember the court revelations that revealed your collaboration with Omid Scobie and Carolyn Durant? I mean, that's just one lie that you tried to hide. But as I've said in previous videos, even about Harry's attendance at the coronation, Harry doesn't do anything Meghan doesn't want him to do. So as long as Meghan doesn't want anything to do with her own family, Harry ain't doing a thing. So I wouldn't hold my breath for Harry to miraculously become some kind of a peacekeeper, you know, when he's barely been able to keep the peace with his own family. On Samantha's part, her comments on hopes for reconciliation were a bit more, you know, bitter because it's sad in the sense that these are two sisters at the end of the day, but more in line with reality. I don't think she would do it without a motive. I don't think she's capable of empathy, remorse, or shame. I don't think she could feel enough to apologize. It's sad. It really is. But I think Samantha has hit the nail on the head. Because how do you trust someone like that? How do you believe that they've truly turned a new leaf and have decided to make amends without an ulterior motive? But unlike his daughter, Thomas Markle is still holding out for a miracle. Meg, I love you. I love my grandchildren. I'm open to any kind of conversation. Thank you. I have to say, my heart breaks for Thomas. His sweetness and his kindness and his tenderness, his vulnerability, his raw emotion, you know, it just oozes out of him. It radiates. And that's, it's not something you can fake. It was so difficult to listen to him without feeling his pain and his sorrow, which he says he feels every day over what his daughter has done to him. Because at the end of the day, you know, as with most interviews with Thomas Markle, as much as this was an opportunity for him to set the record straight, it was yet again another plea to his daughter for forgiveness, for clarification, for one more chance to speak to her, to see her, to understand what went wrong. The only hope I have here is that he looks well, he looks healthy, and I pray and hope that he has yet, you know, a number of years ahead of him, and I hope that he gets the reconciliation with his daughter that he so desperately wants. Because I think there would be nothing sadder in this story than if Thomas Markle were to pass away without ever seeing her again and without even meeting his grandchildren. I mean, one would say if that should happen that he potentially died of a broken heart. I hope that his other children's care and love for him sustains him. I mean, clearly he loves them very much. He refused to cut them off for Megan's sake and, you know, risked his own relationship with her to maintain his relationship with them. And I'm so glad he made the right decision because they're there for him. They love him. And at least he knows he'll have them by his side, you know, towards the end. We only have one set of parents. And I understand some parents deserve to be cut off. They're abusive, they're horrific. But Thomas Markle is the exact opposite of such a parent. He is an exemplary father. And Meghan touted his many contributions to her life and how much he loved her. She reminisced frequently on her social media. So we know this to be the truth. As much as I don't agree with Megan and I really don't like the way she behaves. I really hope that one day soon, because she is running out of time with her father, she'll grow just enough of a heart to go and see him along with her children. You know, we can only hope for Thomas's sake. Unfortunately, I'm not holding my breath because Samantha's right. If there's no ulterior motive, Megan's really in this for herself. Uh, yeah, I think I'm just gonna leave it there. I wish all the Markles, Thomas and Thomas and Samantha, peace of mind and just peace. Peace, just peace to everyone except for the bots who 
keep trying to steal your money and pretend that they're me. I mean, come on, please. <laughs> Bye.